right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Hey. You, you guys all right? Good morning, everybody. Hey, all right. Uh, there we go. All right. Hey, come on up. Yeah, take a, take a seat. Take a seat. Here you go. Here's, here's a, hey, so, all right. So this morning we have, um, we, ca- we have an opportunity, um, just like a couple weeks ago, I mentioned a family that was in need, uh, and um, there is a, uh, another family that, man, come on now, these Pearl Snap shirts. Okay, anyway, yeah, uh, all right. Um, there's another family that, that really needs our help, and uh, can't think of a better uh, group of people to uh, bring that request to than the church. And so uh, everybody, this is uh, Judy Kane. Everybody say hi, Judy. Oh, oh, see, that's nice. Look at you guys. That was sweet. Yeah, that was good. All right. Well, um, well, you're going to tell us this morning. Uh, well, first, uh, you, you, you're a teacher. Yes. And, and where do you teach? Special education. Oh, okay. Wow. Georgetown ISD. Wow. Special yes. education for Georgetown ISD. Let's, let's give a big hand for our teachers. Yes. Yes. That's never boring. Yeah. Ne- ne- never boring. Never boring for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, this morning you want to tell us about a, uh, a little girl named Gabby. I do. And I think we have a picture of her right there. Look, oh, there's Gabby. Everybody there's go, aw. Aw, oh, see, see, good job, good job. All right, yeah, so so what's, what's going on with Gabby? So I've known Gabby for several years. Um, she, between the ages of two and three, was diagnosed with childhood leukemia. And the procedures and medicine that saved her life Um, caused a significant cognitive impairment for her. And so that's what led her on her path into my world. And so she was doing great. And fifth grade, we noticed some just decline in ability. And I kind of brought it to our diagnosticians, like, hey, something's changing. I'm seeing some, some changes in ability. And they're like, well, we'll keep an eye on it. Well, when she graduated fifth grade with me, um, she didn't show up for middle school like she was supposed to in August. Mm. So I was asked to reach out to the family, find out what's going on. And in August, um, the headaches and the cognitive decline was linked to a glioblastoma she was diagnosed with. And so um, at the time she was given a year, about nine months to a year to live. And we're now um, towards the end of her life. Um, She, her recent scans have shown not only, I mean, she's gone through radiation and they, they were able to do some chemotherapy to try to slow down the growth, but um, in July, the growths and brain cancer were everywhere. And so she, her family is really um, seeking help and assistance, yeah. um, emotional, spiritual, yeah. financial. Um, they don't have a home church. And so... Yeah. Um, I've been able to, with donations, um, keep the family going with gift cards right? because um, they would go back and forth to Dell Children's, and it's been rough. And so we're, we're just yeah. reaching out to see what we can help this family mm. with. Um, they're going to yeah. need help. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and, and when we heard that they didn't have a home church and, and everything like that, then, uh, you know, as, as me and Judy were talking, we thought, well, we'll be their home church. Yes. Um, we will... Uh, we will surround this family with love, and, and what we'd like to do is, is treat them like one of our own and, and really surround them and help them in any way we can. So, so Judy, what, what are some of the things that we can, we can do to help? Any donation um, of gift cards, um, financial support, um, they're going to need help with end-of-life um, plans, yeah. a, a service, um, a funeral, um, just any, any type of support would be so appreciative. Yeah. Um, for this family. They've yeah. been through a lot. Oh, so, and they and Gabby has two other siblings. So, oh, wow. it's been rough on everybody. Oh, I'm sure. So. I'm sure. Well, well church, um, we're just putting this need before you and and what I'm going to do is that after service I'm going to ask Judy to to stay around sure. up here on the stage or whatever and if you can help in any way, um, please come forward and talk to Judy personally if you want to uh, if you're able to donate, if you want to run those donations through the church, that's fine. Um, just uh, make your uh, payments on the app or, or check and, and make sure they're right, something about uh, on the check, like, you know, Gabby or something like that to make sure that that goes to the right fund. Uh, but, yeah, definitely come up to, to Judy afterwards and see what we can do to help. But let's really surround this family. I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, just the, 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 the potential of losing a child is just, I just, oh, my goodness. Um, so, so let's let's figure out other ways too. We got financial, but also emotional and spiritual, and all those other ways. Let's 
let's really come up and, and see what we can do to help this family. All right. Um, thank you, Judy, for sure. being a part of this thank family's you. life and for um, uh, for loving this family well. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this as well. Thank you. I appreciate so, it. Uh, mm -hmm. I know they would. Mom gave right. me permission to share her information out there. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and pray, and uh, and yeah, we'll. We'll, uh, we'll do that. We'll pray for Gabby. And, and what's the mom? Or can you share the mom's yes, name? Yes, yeah. Rachel. Rachel. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rachel. Okay. Let's pray. Father, oh God, our, our heart breaks, Lord, and hearing about the story of little Gabby. And, and um, Lord, we just live in a broken world. And Lord, we just long for the day where we will be with you forever where there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more cancer, none of that stuff, God. Lord, our, our heart breaks. And, uh, we pray for this family. We want to pray for Rachel and, and pray for the whole family and pray for Gabby's siblings as well, Father. We pray that you wrap your arms of love around this family and you care for them during this time, Lord. I pray that you help us as a church to respond and to... Uh, really be a, um, a source of comfort and strength and hope for this family in need, Lord. Um, Lord, I just, there, it's times like this that we don't even know, really know what to pray for. But Lord, I'm so grateful that through your Holy Spirit, you, you speak with words that, uh, that, that uh, you go beyond just our speech, Lord. Lord, ultimately we pray for healing. And we know that you have the power to do that. We pray that you put your healing hand upon Gabby and that the next appointment, the cancer is completely gone. Um, but Lord, even if you choose not to do that, Lord, um, yet will we trust in you. We put our hope and our, and our trust in you, God, as the one true God, and it's through the name of Jesus. Well, this, this goes along with kind of the sermon series we're going to be doing for the next couple days, or the next couple days, couple weeks. Um, I'm, we're, yeah, we're still in uh, uh, Bad Habits of Jesus, and we're talking about how Jesus procrastinates. Jesus doesn't always show up when we want him to. But the question I want to start off with, especially thinking about Gabby and this situation, is have you ever been angry with God? Have you ever been angry with God? Have you ever been frustrated at God's timing? You know, you've been praying, God, show up. God, do something. God, I need help. And, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're knocking on the door and, and no one seems to be answering. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever wondered if God is even listening to you? You've cried out over and over, God, help this situation. God, be with this situation. God, come and intervene but it doesn't seem like God is listening. Um, if you've been in the Christian faith any amount of time at all, you've experienced that. It's a very human feeling. I mean, a common theme throughout the Bible is actually people questioning God's timing. We see this over and over and over again through Scripture. You just have to read into the Psalms just a little bit to hear David say something like in Psalm uh, 13. He says, How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? A lot of times we think that it's not good or it's not okay to cry out to God and to get frustrated and all those. After all, he's God and we're not. No, the Bible tells us over and over and over again, cry out to God. There are entire books of the Old Testament that are dedicated to people crying out to God, saying uh, the book of Habakkuk, for instance, which I know, that's uh, you just read that yesterday. I know that's a, a fan favorite, right? Jokes. But um, uh, it, it's one of those books that you hear over and over. Habakkuk is like, look, God, this is not okay. You need to fix this. Where are you? And God responds. The whole book of Lamentations is a book about Lamentations is a, is a book about people crying out, saying, where are you, God? That is a part of the Christian experience. 
That is a part of the Christian experience, and it's okay to do those things. The theme is not only in the Old Testament, though, but it's also in the New Testament as well. One of Jesus' bad habits, actually, is Jesus was a serial procrastinator. He was always late. He was always doing his own thing, and it seemed like he was showing up late. I'll give you uh, uh, two instances. On at least two instances, Jesus' procrastination actually cost people their lives. You see, in uh, the first occasion is in Mark chapter 5 with Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. Uh, Jesus is walking, and, and uh, Jer- Jairus' uh, servant comes and says, Hey, uh, this, this guy's daughter is about to die. You need to hurry up and be there because you can do something about it. And he's like, cool, I'm on my way, all right? And so he's walking, and this lady who's been sick for, you know, uh, years and years and years uh, and has an ailment, stops him and touches the hem of his garment, and he goes, hey, who touched me? And then he, he spends his time talking to this lady who's already been sick for all these years. Don't you think she could wait a few more minutes? But no, Jesus stops, and he pays attention to her. And as he's talking to her and, and, and um, uh, taking care of a woman that really could have waited, this other girl dies. Can you believe that? You know, can you imagine being in Jairus' position? You know, looking out the the window and seeing Jesus stop and talking to people in the crowds while his daughter is dying. And he's sitting there going, what are you doing? Don't you have any priorities? Come on now, this is higher priority. How many times have we felt like that in our prayer life? God, it seems like you're helping this person and you're helping this person. But come on, I'm the priority here. Let's do this, right? You felt that, right? I know I have. But don't worry, if you, if you don't know the story, eventually he comes and raises the dead. It's beautiful. It's a, you know, he, he raises her back to life. So the second occasion is the death of Lazarus. And this is even a tougher one for me because it's in John chapter 11. And Jesus heard about Lazarus, Lazarus's, whew, that's to say that 10 times fast, uh, illness, and he waited to go see him on purpose. He waited. He's like, oh, oh, he's about to die. Well, I need to stay here for a few more days. Does that make any sense to you? What, what do you mean? He, sometimes when we cry out, he waits on purpose? He doesn't come and relieve things right away? What are you talking about? But then Martha, she, she meets him when he finally shows up after Lazarus has been dead. uh, uh, Martha comes out to the road and meets him and says, if you would have only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Have you felt that before in your life? God, if you would have only done this, this would have been different. God, if you would have just shown up. I don't know about you, but I've, I've felt that. I've felt that. I've been there. I've been there, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have been there as well. And what I want to do for the next two weeks is I want to talk about maybe reasons why God procrastinates. I want to talk about reasons why God seems not to answer our prayers. I want to, I want to talk about what it, what it feels like when God is on mute. Uh, and I know this is not like a super happy topic or whatever, but I think it's a very real one. Because a lot of times we wonder where God is, and I think there are some reasons. And this week I'm going to give some kind of, some basic kind of, I don't know, peripheral reasons or whatever. And then next week we're really going to dig into the big, 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 deep reasons and stuff like that. All right? So let's let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a framework on this. Uh, We're going to talk about, if you're taking notes, um, we're going to be talking about uh, God's world this week. And then next week, we're going to be talking about God's will and God's war. Um, because uh, when you're preaching, everything has to start with the same letter. That's, that's like a rule, all right? And there has to be three as well. It can't be four. It has to be three. I don't know. I don't know. That's just the rules, right? Okay. All right. So number one, one of the reasons why um, it seems like God doesn't answer our prayers or is not answering the way that we want is um, because of God's world. Um, there, it's not the way his world works. You know, number one is common sense. Common sense. Some of our prayers aren't answered 
because honestly, what do you want God to do? You know, um, C.S. Lewis says to God, you may attribute miracles to him, but not nonsense. Um, if, we, if we were to stop and think about some of the things that um, we say when we pray, we would realize that some of the things that we say do not make sense. I'll give you an example, all right? There was a time when I was driving from uh, San Diego, California, where we used to live, to Lubbock, Texas. I don't know why I wanted to leave San Diego and go to Lubbock, but I did, all right? Anyway, we were driving there, and you know, as you, uh, uh, if you've ever been to San Diego, as you go over like this little hill thing, you get into the desert that lasts forever, all right? So you're just, I mean, gas stations are miles and miles and miles and miles and miles apart, right? I mean, you, there, there's, there's nothing. It's a wasteland, all right? You know, it's, um, anyway, um, <laughs> poor people who grew up in New Mexico. So I'm sorry about that, yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's just, it's just nothing from San Diego to Lubbock, all right? Um, well, one time I was driving, and um, I, was ri- I, I, was, I was on fumes, all right, out in the middle of nowhere. And there, it, it was like it said, I don't know, like 100 miles to the next gas station. And I was on fumes. I mean, I, I just, I didn't fill up when I, I should have and all this other stuff, whatever. And I was sitting there, and what do you think I was doing? I was praying. I was like, God, please, please, God. Just let there be a gas station. The sign's already said 100 miles, right? But I'm sitting there going, God, please let there be a gas station. Please let let the car just miraculously have more gas in it to get me to the, please, Lord, please, I'm so sorry. I will obey you more. I'm sorry for what I did in the third grade. I mean, you know, I'm I'm confessing all this stuff, trying to get him to to be on my side. You know, we do that sometimes in prayer. Um, Well, when we really think about that prayer, and it wasn't wrong for me to pray that, by the way. I'm glad that I was able to talk to my father about those things. But what I'm saying is, what was he supposed to do? Drop a gas station out in the middle of a cow field? Like, a boom, you know, like have angels, you know, attending to the gas? Oh, yeah, because Paul wanted a gas station. I, you know, the whole world revolves around Paul, so let's stop everything I'm doing. And let's, ba-ba-boom, gas station, you know? What was I expecting him to do? You know, it just wasn't going to happen, right? In Mark Twain's book, The Adventures of uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn, Huck Finn gave up on prayer because he received fishing line with no hooks in it. All right? Um, Now, I'm not going to lose my faith because I have to walk a couple miles with a gas can. All right, there are some prayers that God doesn't answer because what do you want God to do? You know, do you want the gas station to fall out of the sky? And, and a lot of times it's because we made a mistake. I should have filled up gas, but I want God to get me out of it. Now, am I saying that God couldn't allow that to happen? Couldn't make that happen? Am I saying that God doesn't have enough power to miraculously put more gas in my car to get me to the next station? No, God does. God is God. He can do whatever. But come on, come on, you know what I'm saying? Like that should have been the point, point number one, come on, all right? All right, number two, point number two, contradiction. Some prayers aren't answered because they contradict other prayers. In a world of eight billion people, there has to be thousands of prayers at any time that contradict one another, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you an easy one. Um, I was praying that the Mavericks would win the finals. And I was praying hard, too. I was praying with all my might, and he should have allowed me to get my prayer, you know, around instead of the Boston fans, you know? Like, I'm I'm sure there were people in Boston that were praying for Boston to win, too. But he should have listened to me. After all, I'm a preacher, right? You know, but anyway, uh, uh, I'll I'll take that up with him later. But anyway, I'm praying. Somebody else is praying. There's contradiction uh, that's happening. I'll give you another example. Uh, A bride may be praying for sunshine on her wedding day, but a farmer in the field next uh, right over is praying for rain. Well, what's God supposed to do? You know, what's what's he supposed to do with that? Okay, yeah, I guess. Yes, he, he could do that. He could have it rain on the field and give them sunshine and stuff. And then what we, what we get, though, is this idea that God sort of becomes a pinball machine. He kind of goes bing, 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 running around helping us, going, can I serve you some more? Can I help you? Can I help you? All this other stuff. Sometimes prayers contradict. Yes, he totally could have done that, actually. Um, uh, for instance, 
I was mad. Uh, I was mad that a flight got delayed. Um, the uh, last time I flew, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever been there. <laughs> There's a lot of people there right now. Whew. Anyway, I was mad that a flight got delayed, and another person came to the um, came to the terminal and was like, "Oh, thank goodness it was late. I barely made it." Well, kind of contradictory prayers, right? Contradictory prayers. Um, I think what uh, happens most of the time is God hears our prayers sympathetically and meets us in our need by allowing life to proceed as normal. He, he just allows things to proceed as normal. We have to be careful not to make prayer self-centered, where, where we're kind of the center of our own universe, like we're the main actor in the story, because when that happens, prayer stops being about uh, submitting to the wisdom of God, and it makes God... Uh, start to look like a cosmic version of those bright flashing pinball machines frantically flicking around uh, you know playing timetables and weather fronts and basketball scores and world markets at the behest of his cre- uh, creation um, and that's not what it's about now this doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray for small or little things you know I don't think there's anything wrong with praying for what I consider small things, you know. Uh, next week we'll get into the big things, all right. I'm talking about small things this week. But um, number one, we should pray for those things because we can. It's a privilege to be able to talk to our God, you know. It's, it's, uh, God loves to hear from us, and we, I love to talk to God. You know, like I, I showed you, I told you that analogy a while back of, of um, my son, Soren, my 10-year-old, sitting down with me and him telling me all about Pokemon. Now, I have no idea what Pokemon is, except for Pikachu. Everybody knows Pikachu. But anyway, I, I, don't, I don't know any other character or whatever, but he sat next to me and he told me everything in the world about Pokemon. I didn't know what he was talking about. I couldn't do anything for him. I couldn't help him in any way or whatever, but I just sat there and I was like, huh? I love to hear from my kid. It was the greatest conversation ever because I just loved that he wanted to talk to me. So prayer is kind of like that. There's nothing wrong with talking to God. Number two, sometimes God does intervene in supernatural ways. God still has the ability to act. He still does. He still breaks through at times, and he acts in supernatural ways, and we've all been aware of those things. I think sometimes we expect those things to happen on a daily basis because when we read Scripture, it seems like God is always doing something miraculous. But we have to remember there are years and years and years and years and years in between these events, you know? It's not like they're just happening one after the other or whatever, you know? But God does still act in supernatural ways. And then finally, number three, uh, praying for tiny things opens us up to God's blessing and helps us live with gratitude. This is why we pray for our daily bread, even in a land of plenty. I still wake up and say, Lord, uh, as, as, uh, as Brandon said in the prayer, you know, Lord, give us today our daily bread. Well, I don't really need to, I don't need to pray that to get my daily bread because I have a refrigerator full of food and I have a pantry full of food and all those other things. But I pray that prayer be out of gratitude of thank you, God, for what you've given me. Thank you. And it's made me more grateful. Number three, laws of nature. Some prayers aren't answered because they would be detrimental to the world and and to the lives of others. All right, we get these first two points, but we still have trouble when bad things happen. We want to believe that every prayer for healing will work. And I have faith that God can do it, that's why I pray. That every car hurtling towards a child could break in time, that every marriage could be restored, and that every prodigal will come home. But God has created these governing principles, these laws of nature, and they are infinitely complex, and they work in exquisite harmony. It's a beautiful creation. When you dip your toe into science uh, and biology and all these other things that I I tended to freak through in high school, but later on I learned, uh, you know, is when you start dipping your toe in some of those things and you learn about some of those things, you're like, wow. The way God made creation is beautiful. It is so simplis- uh, simple, but yet it is so complex. And we see that over and over and over again. And we are subject to those laws. For instance, the other day um, when I was getting a coffee mug out of the kitchen 
uh, you know, cupboard or whatever, I cannot switch off gravity uh, for that cup to fall on my toe, you know, because when I got it out, it slipped and it hit me right in the toe. Mm. Oh, man. Oh, whoo. Yeah. I had to pray through that one, let me tell you, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, right in the little toe, too. Man, oh, man, why is that one always the one, man? But anyway, I couldn't stop the laws of gravity. God wouldn't necessarily do that. I wouldn't be like, God, please don't let it hit my toe. <laughs> wouldn't that be wild? Like the cup just stops, and I'm like, Luke, use the false. You know, I mean, that, that's awesome, you know, you know. But he's not going to do that. He's not going to break laws of nature because he's, he's, we're subject to those laws. Um, to quote C.S. Lewis, ah, um, that God can and does on occasions modify the behavior of matter and produce what we call miracles is a part of the Christian faith. It is. But the very concept of a common and therefore stable world demands that these occasions should be extremely rare. That's what it means. If God kept intervening in the laws of nature over and over and over again, one man's miracle would be another man's misery. Okay? If God intervened on every storm that would have devastating effects, oh God, protect us from this storm. If he would do that for every storm, um, the world would be in chaos because storms are the air conditioning system of the earth. Boom, science class, high school, uh, listen that day, right? Without storms, the tropics would, would get hotter and the Arctic would get colder and it would throw everything off of balance. See, everything works together. What I'm saying is, reluctantly, God says no to many prayers for the sake of the majority. And you've got to imagine how hard that is for him. To look at the majority and, and, you know, and go, oh man, I know this person's hurting and I want to be near them. I mean, we, our, our God is a God that sympathizes with us and he, he mourns with us and he actually came down from heaven in the form of Jesus to be with us and oh, he, his heart aches. But he reluctantly says no to some of our prayers for the sake of the majority. Number four, um, life is tough. Some of our uh, prayers aren't answered because um, creation um, was broken because of sin. Sin did more than affect our relationship with God. We usually talk about sin breaking our relationship with God, and that's the way we talk about it. But no, sin broke us down to our very DNA. Sin broke creation down to its fabric. It broke creation, and it left us in a world of frustration um, and that is uh, that is subject to frustration and has not yet fully um, has not yet been fully liberated from its bondage of decay, as Romans eight chapter says. Uh, uh, Romans chapter eight says, "Man, I'm talking like Yoda this morning." Okay, tragically, life in such an environment and is inevitably going to uh, be difficult at times. There's going to be difficulty. We hear stories all the time of people having a tough go at life. I heard a story the other day of this guy who had a daughter, and before the age of three, she had three major operations. Then after she was recovering, the church that they loved and that they were a part of disbanded over, over disputes and disunity and all this other stuff. Then he was diagnosed with cancer. All of these things kept hitting. And, you know, doesn't it seem like that happens in life, that one thing hits and then it's a domino effect and all this other stuff? And you sit there and you go, man, how much more can this family take, God? What is going on? You know, all this stuff over and over again. And then what I find interesting is I'm the one with that attitude usually. I'm sitting there watching a family go through all these struggles going, God, show up and do something. What are you doing? And then you talk to the family, and this is what the guy said. He said, well, I guess I used to think that, that I had some kind of divine right to be happy. I mean... Obviously, I knew that there were going to be the occasional rough patches, but well, to be honest with you, these days I find it easier just to accept that life's tough, like they did hundreds of years ago. Then to sort of, uh, uh, then to feel sort of hard done as if I'm being robbed. And then this is what he says at the end. He says, why blame God for stuff that's just the reality of life on a messed up planet? 
life is inherently tough. And in our world of comfort and blessing, where we really have been um, insulated from the world's troubles, any little tough thing that comes into our life rocks us to the core. But when you go over and you travel anywhere in the world and you see some of the things that they're going through, they don't look at it that way. They see it a little differently. Again, to quote C.S. Lewis, I don't know, maybe I'm on a C.S. Lewis kick today, but he said, lay down this book and reflect for five minutes on the fact that all the great religions were first preached and long practiced in a world without chloroform. Well before all the pain medications and all the things that we can do to numb ourselves from the pain. Imagine two sets of people living together in the same grand old dilapidated building. Half of them think it's an expensive hotel and they are bitterly disappointed and the other half think it's a prison and they are pleasantly surprised. Sometimes I think it's about expectations. When G.K. Chesterton, a famous theologian and writer, he said when he finally gave up on trying to be optimistic about the world and accepted it for the fallen and broken place that it is, he didn't feel depression. Actually, it says, and I quote, his heart sang for joy like a bird in spring. Why? Why is that? Something that he really hung on to and stuff is because instead of looking at blessings as the norm, he saw them, he saw blessings as the gift from God. Instead of looking at a life of blessing as the norm and the default, he looked at, he said, nope, this world is going to be hard, it's broken, there's all kinds of messed up things, and when, when blessing comes into my life, I'm going to rejoice, because that is not the norm, that is a gift from God. Do you see how the expectations kind of change the way we see the world? And finally, for today anyway, we'll talk about more next week, doctrine. Some prayers aren't answered the way we think they should because of our understanding and expectations of God are misguided. Job 13, verse 15 says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Everything was taken away from Job. But he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. What we see over and over and over again is faith is forged in the fires of struggle. Faith is formed and forged in the fires of struggle. We see this uh, through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, when being commanded to worship an idol. This is what they said. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O God. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Don't you see in this passage, you see two levels of faith. You see two levels of faith. One is faith in a miracle, that God will save us. Do you see that faith? And that is a good faith to have. We need to have that faith. We need to be people who believe in miracles. We need to be people who pray in the name of Jesus and know that he can act and will act on our behalf and on, the half, uh, on behalf of those that we are serving. We have to believe in a God that can heal, that can bring health to what is lost, can bring life to death, can bring uh, peace to chaos. We believe in that God, and that is a certain level of faith, and it's so good to have that faith. But then another level of faith is faith in suffering. The faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had faith that God could save them from the fiery furnace, but they also had faith that even if he does not, he is still God. He is still God. He is still sovereign, and his way is best. I don't understand it. I don't know why he's doing it. I'm confused. I'm upset, and all of those things are okay. But our God is sovereign. His ways are higher than our ways, and we will trust in Him. That's what we're called to. That's the, that's the second level, or another level of faith. Many people are shattered when God doesn't answer their prayers. They begin to doubt God and start to disconnect from Him. 
We sometimes expect God to make all of our problems disappear, but the Bible teaches that in, in Romans 8, it says that we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. In John 16, Jesus tells us to expect the exact opposite of an easy life if we are Christians and we are called to that. A woman named Margaret that I read about a while back was dying of cancer and she wrote these words. I'm sitting there uh, reading about Margaret's life thinking, what a tragedy. What a tragedy and it's, my heart is breaking. But these are the words that she wrote. She said, this is not the worst thing to ever happen. She said, cancer is so limited. It cannot cripple love, shatter hope, corrode faith, eat away peace, destroy confidence, kill friendship, shut out memories, silence courage, quench the spirit, or lessen the power of Jesus. That is faith. That is faith. That is not pie in the sky optimism. That is Christianity and the Christian spirit at work. That's what it means to be a Christian. We have to understand that we live in between the fall and the resurrection. We live in a broken world and we live in this gap, this in-between world. But what I want you to know is Jesus fills this in-between space with himself. He comes to us in our weakness and he gives us of himself. Let me be absolutely clear about this. While suffering is part and parcel of the Christian life, God hates it as much as you do and has gone to great lengths to destroy the power of death. He weeps with you. He mourns with you. He cries with you. That's why Jesus came to defeat the power of death so we could put our hope in something larger than the present sufferings of this age. This should lead us into deeper prayer not away from it. So this morning, there are some of you that have been crying out to God for a long time. And he just seems like he's on mute. You can't hear him. What I want to encourage you to do, and I see this time and time again throughout Scripture, is I want to encourage you to keep crying out to God because God hears your prayers and will respond in his way and in his timing. And even though we think he may be late in responding, God's timing is always perfect. And we put our trust and hope in that. Again, God's ways are not our ways. I, I remember um, my, uh, I think I've told you this story before, but my grandmother died when I was 12 years old. And I know every morning she prayed for me. I actually heard her sometimes say my name in prayer because I'd be like, say what? You know, and, you know, what are you praying about, you know? and stuff. Um, I am here this morning standing on this stage because she prayed, and I didn't once go to church with her before she died. Prayers outlive us. God's timetable is different than our timetable, but that doesn't mean our prayers are in vain. Lift your prayers up to God. Keep praying to God. Trust in a miracle. Trust that God will intervene because he has people everywhere that are intervening in all kinds of different ways on behalf, of, uh, uh, on behalf of him. I know that people came into my life later on in my life because my grandmother many years ago prayed. Keep faith that God's timing is perfect. If you need to pray with one of our prayer team or our elders, our elders and our prayer team are actually going to be back by the pillars. Back here we have like four pillars. They're going to be back here. If you need prayers during this time, if you want to pray about anything, something going on in your life, if you want to go back and just uh, uh, lift up more prayers for Gabby and the family that, that, that we're going to uh, have, have a privilege of helping, if, if you want to pray for anything, family members, what's going on in your life, the state of the world, whatever, let's lift those prayers up to God and trust um, that God's timing is perfect. Let's stand and sing. Amen.